Welcome back everyone, we have some big news to get into. I did a video a couple days ago about a bunch of earnings reports coming up, including Disney's. And Disney just reported earnings. They reported a lot of news, like they're going to be apparently letting go of, of thousands of employees, 7,000. They're reinstating the dividend, that's kind of big news. And also the activist investor, Nelson Peltz, is stepping back. He was very satisfied with this quarter. And the stock even had a pretty good bump after hours. It's a little bit up today. And then we have all the financials and the numbers here. So we're gonna be looking at that as well on Qualtrum. So I'll be giving you a full overview of the earnings. We're gonna be diving into Disney, where the company stands right now, and what I plan on doing with my holding. Because I do own a little bit of Disney stock. It's a company that I'm currently invested in. So I'll be going over all of that in this episode. Now, having said that, let's go ahead and jump right in. We'll start off with a quick portfolio update. For those of you that are new to the channel, if you've been joining along this year, welcome. I do something a bit different than most channels. I show transparency with my portfolio, the actual portfolio, not just spreadsheets, but the actual dashboard of the portfolio and my all-time returns from the beginning with everything that I'm doing. So with both portfolios that I have, the story fund here or the passive income account, I'm showing you what I'm doing with my money and how it works out. And the reason that I've done this is to encourage a positive change in the financial atmosphere. Before I was doing this, I don't know anybody that would give frequent updates on their actual returns. People would act like they're the best investors. They never make mistakes. They never have anything going to the red. And that's just not how investing works. If you're buying individual stocks, or even if you're buying ETFs, once in a while, you'll be going into the red. Now, this was at minus 20% last week. We moved down to minus 32% because in the past week, my largest holding, which is Amazon, is down 12%. It had an after hour sell off after its uh, earnings report. The stock moved down. It's still up pretty big year to date. So it's up 15%, but it gave up a lot of those gains. And if we look at the actual holdings here, this gives it a little bit more clarity. Amazon is just what's killing me. It's the biggest holding and it's in the red by 16,000. So if this company recovers, which I fully expect it will, my gains will recover. My, my losses will move into the positive. It's heavily dependent on Amazon. So we'll see how that turns out. Either way, I will continue to track it like I've done so from the beginning. This is my returns relative to the benchmark, which is the S&P 500. I choose the S&P 500 over the QQQ, over IGV, over the Dow Jones, over WCLD, because the S&P 500 is emblematic of the overall stock market. I view it as the most difficult benchmark to beat over long periods of time. Now, this is what this looks like from the beginning of this portfolio. Currently right now, the S&P 500 is in the green by 4.73%, and then my portfolio is in the red by 12.41%. Another way of saying that is that my portfolio is trailing SPY by around 16%. That is the gap that I have to fill here. So that's where we're at right now, and I'll continue to track this portfolio, my buys and sells, and the performance of it. So if you wanna see that, just make sure you're following along with the channel. Now, before we jump into Disney's earnings, which is the big one here, I wanna talk about a couple other companies that I had predictions on with their earnings report. First up is Chipotle, the Mexican grill company, the burrito company, and their earnings were good. I thought it was decent. They had revenue, it was up a little bit. I think they missed on their revenue and EPS, but I don't really look at the hit and miss as much as the overall progress of the company. The progress of the company is revenues are growing, free cash flows are growing, margins are expanding, earnings per share growing over time, and this burrito joint opened up another 100 locations. I, I just think it's a good story. Everything's going in the right direction. Now, the stock is down a little bit over the past week, like five or 6%, but year to date, it's up 20%. So what can you expect, right? A lot of these companies that run up, they give up their gains. But overall, I really thought that Chipotle's I thought that their earnings report was pretty solid all around. And I've said this many times with really well done food joints like Chipotle's, McDonald's, I think uh, Starbucks, I think Texas Roadhouse, I think all of these type of companies, I think they're gonna have a decent fourth quarter of 2022. Now, having said that, another company that I had a prediction on that I thought the earnings were going to be good is a firm. The company's down 22% right now. After its report this morning, it's down 22%. The reason that I thought this company would actually have decent earnings is because a firm is a buy now, pay later firm. So you just pay for something after purchasing it. 
And that's a little bit similar to what MasterCard and Visa does, right? You put things on a credit card and you pay for it later, right? So they're kind of in the same business. And Visa and MasterCard both reported very strong earnings. So I thought, huh, Visa and MasterCard had very strong earnings and their business model is somewhat similar to a firm's. And then a firm may have good earnings. Now, obviously that isn't the case. If we read this note here on Qualtrim, a firm shares are trading lower after the company reported worse than expected Q2 results, issued weak guidance and announced a 19% workforce reduction. So they're chopping off a, a fifth of their workforce. Just incredible. I do want to mention though, my prediction wasn't entirely wrong because I said these type of companies are incredibly risky. I also mentioned in my predictions video, a fair warning about this type of company. I said that it can drop 20 or 30% in a day. I think that's what I said. Let me roll the clip. And if you are investing in a company like a firm, just be aware this is the type of company that could drop 20 or 30% in a single day if it doesn't meet its earnings. So it's highly speculative, highly risky. Just keep that in mind if you're, you're speculating on that type of company. All right, so I did warn about that and the company did drop a bit. 20% is quite the drop. Now, again, it's up 41% this year. So in just a month and a half, it's up 41%. What can you expect? Firm is not the type of company that I'll be buying anytime soon. Now, next up, we have the big earnings report, which is Disney. First of all, we have the top and bottom line, which overall, it was good, better than expected. We have a note here saying that Disney shares are trading higher after the company beat its top and bottom line report. And they had a bunch of announcements. Now we have the latest numbers here, but before we go into the numbers and the cash flows and look at how the company's fundamentals are doing, I think it's important to review how the actual company is positioning itself. What's going on qualitatively with this company? For example, we have an interview here with uh, Bob Iger, the new Bob. He's returned back to run Disney and he's asked about a lot of different subjects. And this is such a huge change from what Bob Chapek was doing. And that's what I wanna highlight, the difference between Bob Iger and Bob Chapek. Let's go ahead and take a look here at the first thing. This is just one part of this interview. I'll just play like a 10 second clip. Um, I'm concerned about undifferentiated general entertainment and in the, particularly in the competitive landscape that we're operating in. And we're going to look at it very objectively. Now, he's saying this in reference to Hulu saying that potentially they could sell off Hulu. That's an option. But overall, the thing that I wanted to highlight is Bob Iger saying that he is concerned about general undifferentiated entertainment, meaning Disney just becoming a broad entertainment company that provides entertainment for all people in all situations of all types. That's something he's concerned about because that's highly competitive. That's what Netflix is wanting to do. Netflix is broad, undifferentiated entertainment. They provide entertainment for children, for college kids, for older couples, for anybody. They provide entertainment for everyone. They try to provide entertainment that's basically kind of like trash TV, reality shows, as well as high level entertainment, documentaries. They have their HBO type of shows and then they have their low key type of shows. Netflix is a general entertainment company trying to entertain everyone. And Bob Iger here is saying, that he doesn't want Disney to be the same thing. He does not want Disney to be some broad general entertainment company. And this is extremely different from the route that Bob Chapek was going. Bob Chapek said many times that the Disney Plus service was a hungry beast to feed and that they had to create enough entertainment specific to that service for every type of person in every category. Bob Iger, he's going with a different strategy. He does not want Disney to be this giant streaming service that has all shows for every type of person. He wants Disney to be more fine-tuned, focused on coming out with high quality shows that leverage their very unique intellectual property. To have a streamlined series of Star Wars content, Marvel, Pixar, and then their animated studio works. Disney has all these very unique pieces of IP and they're not really having any type of leverage from that. They're just throwing in random shows. They're creating so much of them that they're kind of making the viewer numb to this type of content. So I think the route that Bob Iger is going is very different than the route that Bob Chapek was going. 
Bob Chapek was spend as much as we can to grow as many subscribers, create shows for every single demographic, and don't focus quite as much on quality. Bob Iger's strategy is to reduce the amount of content, focus more on the quality, not try to aim to please everyone, but instead people that really appreciate Disney's intellectual property. If I had to pick which strategy has a better grasp on how to leverage Disney's brand and IP, I definitely think it's Bob Iger. I think he just knows how to use this content in a beneficial way for Disney. I think that Bob Chapek would have been a good CEO for Netflix. His strategy is very Netflix-like. Just create tons of content for everybody. Doesn't have to be undifferentiated that much. Just create a lot of it, some of it good, some of it bad, but it's enough to entertain almost every demographic. That's Netflix strategy. Netflix is already at scale. Netflix can do that right now profitably. Disney trying to chase Netflix's strategy is a mistake because Disney has all these tools that Netflix doesn't have. They have all their intellectual property. And by trying to mimic what Netflix is doing, they're not leveraging their intellectual property. So I think this switching gears of Disney is overall a good thing. If I was to put this another way, what I think Bob Iger really describes in this interview, his overall direction is making Disney like the HBO of family-oriented entertainment. Think of that, the HBO but for family entertainment. Highly curated, high-quality content released at a steady cadence that allows families to consume very polished series, very high-quality entertainment that's appropriate for kids as well. That would be a strategy that I think would serve Disney very well. And that seems to be the strategy that Bob Iger is going for. Not the one that Bob Chapek is going for, which is to become Netflix part two, an additional Netflix with just Star Wars content. So that's the first thing that I think is important for investors today to know about Disney, a strategic shift in the way that they're looking at their content and the way that they're looking at their release strategy of content for Disney Plus and for the rest of their company. Now, moving on from that, we have another clip here where he goes over the restructuring of the company and how it differs again from what Bob Chapek did. And this is to hold the company more accountable for how the performance of their shows does. The, the structure of the company that had been changed um, uh, you know, by my, 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 I guess my successor and my predecessor by Bob, um, and he had a reason why he wanted to do that and he articulated that, but it, it, it created a, a huge divide between the creative side of the company, the content engines, movies and television, and the monetization distribution side of the company. And while I think he, again, he had you know, certain maybe valid reasons why he wanted to do that at that time, it was very, very apparent to me, both while I was out and when I came back, that that was a mistake. Uh, that there had to be a direct linkage, that the people making the content had to be fully accountable for how it performed in the marketplace and have some say in how it was brought to market. Do you see the big difference there? The way that Bob Chapek had organized things is basically you had the content creators and then you had the, the other people. I don't know what they are, just business people that decide how the content's released. So you have a group of people working on creating content they don't even know the release strategy of the content. Now that would drive me nuts. If I was creating videos and I didn't even know how they were gonna be released and when and to whom, that would be something that I, I would not get behind. So I can see this causing a lot of, I think a lot of problems internally with the company. For example, just one problem that I'm, I, I think this for sure caused is there's probably a lot of content creators, different animators at Disney, different writers and storytellers working on their craft, creating content, and then it does horribly on the streaming service or in the box office, and they say, hey, this performed really poorly. The content creators say, well, of course it did. You didn't release it how we thought it should be released. So we're not taking accountability for how it performed because we didn't get any say in how our content was delivered to our audience. So that's where a divide happened. You have to have accountability. The same people making the content need to be accountable for how it performs in the box office. So in this case, I think it makes sense. I think it makes sense for the departments that are over content creation to have some say in how the content's actually gonna be delivered to the customer. Otherwise, they don't know who they're creating for and how it's gonna be received. So, so far, Bob Iger's changing directions of the release strategy, trying to have more curated content that's higher quality, less of a general entertainment company like a Netflix, and they're also restructuring the organization to have better accountability. The next thing that he mentioned is jobs cuts. 
like the rest of every company right now, at least all the, the big tech ones, Disney's cutting a lot of jobs. And this is probably necessary. I haven't looked at the numbers, but I'm sure they had some excess in jobs that they could trim. So they're cutting back 7,000 jobs with the goal of saving $5.5 billion in costs. Now, this is something that investors really wanted to see. I think this was more important than a lot of other news in this earnings report because it's showing that Disney's focusing on being profitable. They're focusing on generating more free cash flow. So I think this is a big thing. Now, another piece of news that I think is very welcome news for dividend investors is that they're bringing back the dividend. Bob Iger said that he's going to reinstate the dividend by the end of this year. That's his goal. By the end of 2023, they want to have a reinstated dividend policy. Now, just one little piece of criticism. And I know that this is welcome news. It's positive news that they're bringing back the dividend shows that they want to return more to the shareholders, right? They don't like, I think it's good to reward the shareholders. But one little piece of criticism here, do they have to announce the dividend the exact same day that they're firing 7,000 employees? Just PR, public relations. If I'm the CEO of a company and I'm announcing that I'm laying off 7,000 employees, you're not going to catch me announcing the reinstatement of the dividend the exact same day. That's just not going to happen. So that caught me off guard. If it were me, I would have waited maybe a month. Maybe I would have waited until next quarter. I, I would have just done it on a different day. Even if it was tomorrow, I think it would have been better than literally the same day that they're, they're laying off employees. But either way, there is so much news in this report that I think the dividend news kind of got buried in it. So we have Disney changing release strategies of their content. We have them restructuring the company, firing 7,000 people. They're reinstating the dividend. But then we have the activist investor. Don't want to forget about him. Nelson Peltz. Remember that guy? I was, I was happy to see Nelson Peltz come into the picture and basically just offer a critical voice. I realized that Nelson Peltz was not some media guru that's gonna be able to go in and fix all of their problems, but I'm just happy to have someone that comes in and says, hey, what's going on here? I'm gonna be a very vocal critic of this company, the compensation the management's giving themselves, right? How they're running the company not efficiently, all that type of stuff. Now, in this report, many of the things that Nelson Peltz is criticizing them for have been addressed. Disney has changed a lot of them. They are cutting costs. They're literally firing employees. They did reinstate the dividend. Those are both things that Nelson Peltz said that he wanted to have happen. Now, in this earnings report, Disney did not mention Nelson Peltz one single time. No reference, nothing. But that doesn't mean he didn't have an impact. They happened to address a lot of the things he was criticizing. And I don't think all of that was completely coincidental. I think Disney wanted him off of their back, so they tried to address some of the things without saying, yeah, you bullied us into this. But either way, Nelson Peltz is now out of the picture. He's stepping back. He said, Disney basically just did a lot of the stuff I wanted. I see no battle to be had now. In fact, here's a, an interview where he just called in this morning Basically, just happy about the way things are turning out. These are exciting times. You know, Jim, my dad once told me that you can only win once. This was a great win for all the shareholders. Management at Disney now plans to do everything that we wanted them to do. We wish the very best to Bob, his management team, the board. We will be watching, we will be rooting, and the proxy fight is over. Does this sound like a crazy, horrible uh, vulture capitalist? It sure doesn't. He just says, oh, they did a lot of the stuff I wanted them to do. Congratulations. I wish them success. Uh, he's made a lot of money in the past month. Disney's up like 30%. Um, you know, so he's just happy. He's happy with the way things are turning out. Yes. Thank you for declaring victory in a gracious way. Uh, this was a huge win for you. I bet you, I know you don't typically talk about it, but I'm going to ask you, how much money did you make? Well, it, who, who's counting? <laughs> All right, well, I just, the viewers, the viewers want to count. But I, everybody made money. Money. Jimmy, everybody made money. Jim, Jim Kramer asks him, how much money did he make on this bet? And he just laughs and says, who's counting? And that's the laugh of a billionaire. He made a lot of money over the past month with Disney. I'm assuming Nelson Peltz is probably reducing his stake today. I think he's made a lot of money. The company's gone up on good news. Just my guess. I don't know for sure. 
but I'm assuming that he's, he's selling some of his stake today. We'll see. Now with the activist investor, Nelson Pelt, stepping out of the picture, we finally can just look at the Disney financials. We're gonna be using a tool called Qualtrum.com. This is part of the Patreon membership. And this gives us a full 360 degree look at all the most important fundamentals without bogging up the screen with a million other things that aren't really relevant. So this is an easy way to look at companies and get all the key metrics. If you haven't already, just a quick reminder, in the pinned comment below, there's a link to the Patreon. You can join today and you will not be charged until the beginning of next month. That gives you time to trial this. Try it out. Make sure you love it before you pay a penny for it. So try that out if you haven't. But what we have here is Disney. It's up 2% right now, so it's got a good bump. The market's only up 0.3%. So Disney's up way over the market today. And that's because investors are, they're, they're seeing things a little bit more optimistically. And more importantly, that comes after a month of being up 28%. So Disney's been on a good run and it hasn't given back these gains. It's up even further today. So this will move up to 30% after today. Let's go ahead and look at some of the fundamentals here. We have the revenue of Disney. This company has been very good at growing revenue at a steady clip above inflation for the past three decades. We look at Disney, these long-term entertainment companies do really well. That's part of my thesis on Netflix. They're usually around for 50 years and they just do well. This is from 1985. The revenue per quarter 1985 was half a billion dollars. Now Disney's revenuing $23.51 billion. Massive growth in this company over time. And we can even see this most recent quarter, which we have the recent quarter in Qualtrum right now, it's way above anything historical Disney has done. So revenues are at all time highs, 23.51 billion. Good job, Disney, you have your revenue up. Now we know that revenue doesn't pay the bills. It's important, but it's not the most important thing. We look at the EBITDA. It's not as bad as you'd think. It's actually at 3.3 billion last quarter. That's pretty good. It's not you know, it's not the prime time Marvel Cinematic Universe in the theaters, right, in 2017 through 19, but it's getting back up there. We're starting to catch back up. I think investors today are looking at this and they're thinking, wow, the EBIT is actually recovering pretty quickly. Uh, we look at the cash flows. This last quarter in Q4 of every year is typically a negative cash flow quarter. But what we see here is them not losing more money this quarter in terms of free cash flow. So it was the same that it was last year. So they're actually doing, I think, a better job with their free cash flows. If we factor in stock-based comp, this actually climbed a little bit. It was 270 million last quarter. So the free cash flow last quarter was negative, but this is again, something that they said that they're addressing. The stock-based comp will go down as they're laying off employees, 7,000 of them. And then the free cash flows will go up as they're cutting costs across the board. They're slowing down their content slate. They're focusing on more highly curated content instead of just aggressively spending. So far, I like the developments of the fundamentals. The earnings per share also, I believe beat expectations. It came in here at 70 cents per share. And again, it's not back to where it was, but we're looking at trajectories here. The bottom of COVID, the earnings were just crushed. Now it's starting to recover and head back up. Investors are expecting the earnings to climb around 20% per year. So fast growth from here. We have the balance sheet, the cash and debt of the company. It looks very similar to last quarter. The debt went down a little bit and the cash went down a little bit. So not much of a change there. Nothing significant with the balance sheet. And then they don't pay a dividend right now, but they will be reinstating that. So over time, we should see this dividend return. That'll be interesting to see. And the share count. The shares did go up a little bit, so they're not buying back shares right now. They're not canceling out their dilution with stock-based comp. It's going up 0.4% on a yearly basis, which is very low. So I don't consider this a troubling amount of dilution. So what is my overall takeaway with this earnings? I thought the earnings is really good. I like the direction the company's going. I like that they're cutting costs firing employees. I know that's sad for the employees, but I like to see investments focusing on cost structure of the company, especially if they're struggling with profitability. I like the change in strategy. I don't think Disney should try to become Netflix version two with Star Wars and Marvel. I think it should be Disney, finely curated, high quality, family appropriate entertainment. And I like that they're bringing back the dividend. Even if it's a low yield, even if it's more of a symbolic dividend, it shows that they're actually focused on the shareholder. They still care about the shareholder. So I think that's something positive as well. Overall, I think that this earnings report directs Disney and the sentiment of the company in a very positive way. 
Now, in terms of how I'm playing this, the company's up 30% in the past month. I, I'm still in the red on it, but I'm actually taking a little bit out of this company. So I am selling a couple thousand dollars of my holding today. I have other opportunities in my portfolio that I think are very strong companies. Disney's one that even though this earnings report I thought overall was positive, there's just some other companies that I think have a, a lot less challenges to face, a little bit less risk in their business model. So I'm personally trimming my position a little bit here, but I'm still going to be holding Disney. I'm not bearish on the company. I think it actually has a pretty bright future. And like I've said many times, with a company like Disney and the size of moat they have, I think that the company is going to be around for a very long period of time. And if sentiment turns super negative, you have time to wait it out. So that's all for this video. I hope you enjoyed the little summary here. I'll have more content later this week. So subscribe to the channel if you haven't. I'll see you in the next one.